Okay. Hello. Um, <coughs> we, uh, I have made some changes in the lecture plan, as you may have noticed. Uh, and the most important one is that uh, we will have the lecture next week. Uh, uh, in the first plan, I uh, have no lecture schedule for next week, but. Uh, there has come up some uh, traveling in March, so I need to, to cancel the lecture on the 12th of Mar March. And therefore we just uh, uh, adjust the lecture plan accordingly. In addition to that, I have altered the sequence a bit, but that should not be uh, of any, any problem to you. Uh, I had scheduled some pres group presentations, but since uh, there were only four groups that submitted their answers, uh, I have chosen to just give my comments to them directly instead of, uh, of, uh, of giving plenary presentations. Uh, and the fourth change is that um, I will not demand any presentation in, in for the audience about your approach to your assignment. But instead, I will uh, I will uh, give you the opportunity to submit your approach in Fronter within 10th of April, and then I will give you my comments to that, if you if you like to. That is not that is not mandatory, but it's uh, it's an option. And then I'm not I'm not talking about a repetition of the presentations that some of you made uh, in the beginning of the course. But I'm more interested in what type of uh, data do you want to use? What type of methodology do you want to apply? What type of theory are you going to use in, in, your, uh, in your assignment? And of course, a title and a sh very short presentation of the case. And if you have uh, submitted your presentation, you can just uh, you can just refer to that, and then I have, and I have it on on front. So that is uh, that is the changes that I have, uh, I have um, made in the lecture plan. Um, today, <coughs> I'm going to talk a bit about um, transport policy and planning in an economic development perspective. Up to now, uh, mm -hmm. we have discussed uh, a couple of different evaluation methods for transport infrastructure, the cost-benefit analysis, micro-approach, and the macro-approach. Uh, and uh, we have worked a bit with input-output models and with um, this four-step export-driven cumulative causation model. Um, so now we are <coughs> going to, to sort of break a bit uh, with respect to these uh, different theories and approaches that we are going to, to, to talk about in this course and just have a look at, at planning and how we can uh, actually address the communities or the society's needs for uh, for uh, for these types of uh, of efficiency improvements, which the which is the main objective of the transport infrastructure investments, because we can <coughs> we can address from a professional point of view uh, how good a given project is. We can address the impacts of a project. Let's say if the project uh, changes regional competition, we can use the input-output models to say something about what will be the employment and production value effects of that. That was a part of the of the group work last last week. <coughs> um, if the transport infrastructure investments can aid or contribute to an increased export volume from a region. We can 
use models like this four-step model to to assess what will that what will the effects be in terms of of economic development. But both those methods are kind of complementary to a uh, an Im economic impact assessment, which is normally done by means of a cost-benefit analysis. So we try to sort of widen the scope and, and uh, try to present to the decision makers the impacts of the infrastructure investments in terms of uh, employment, production, competition, whether it will benefit <coughs> the importing industry or the exporting industry and so on. So all this all these types of information is, uh, is, is relevant when we talk about planning. Because what we do as, uh, as analysts is to provide the decision-making uh, system, the politicians, or the administrative, uh, the, the bureaucracy if you like, with <coughs> a foundation for their decision-making. Um, and I think because you will learn a bit about various approaches, we will in the coming weeks talk about uh, coming two weeks talk about location theory, and also from those theories we can derive, let's say, um, elements that can be presented to to, to decision makers. We'll talk more about that in the coming two weeks. Uh, but I think now it's time to just go through, let's say, the processes and the approaches that uh, is, uh, is relevant when we are going to, to put forward uh, analytical work to the decision makers and, uh, and to take into consideration what should we actually pay attention to when we, when we plan for, uh, for improving transport systems. So I will talk a bit about uh, transport policy and planning, talk a bit about external factors to be considered in planning, the planning process. Uh, land use and transport planning issues, and we will return to land use issues later on in the course, and, and some important elements that we need to, to, to be aware of. Um, there are two papers that is uh, that are the readings for this uh, this lecture. Um, the first one, transport planning and policy by uh, Rodriguez, Contois, and Slack, is perhaps the most important one because it goes more or less directly into what I'm going to talk about. The second one, by um, I think it was Mackie and Simon, if I remember correctly. Let's see here. No, it was not. It was by Brian Mundoff and Roberts are, uh, are dealing with a specific case, specific transport investment case, and how it affects uh, regional uh, various aspects of, of regional development. Um, so it's always good, as I've said on some occasions, it, it's always good to start with some definitions. Uh, and you should uh, be aware of that when you write your assignments as well, because when you when you're going to to start discussing something, it's always good to have a clear view of what you are actually discussing here. So, <coughs> policy is the means by which governments seek to match social, political, economical, and environmental goals and aspirations with reality. So, trying to work out how we should, let's say, adjust the current situation to, to match better with social, political, economic, and environmental go goals or objectives. So this is what, what we mean when we talk about policy. So, and they, these goals and aspirations are, of course, changing. And uh, hence, <coughs> we 
we are um, we are in the need to be able to adjust the policies as as time goes by and this raises some specific challenges when it comes to transport infrastructure because it's a very transport infrastructure investments are very long term investment they have a lifespan for at least 40 years so <coughs> we need actually to be a bit conscious about not only the current situation but what will be the situation in the future when it comes to let's say uh, particularly the demand side of the story when you deal with forecasting of traffic flows we need to to think quite long uh, quite long time ahead of the today's situation and it may be then that when we are dealing with projects uh, or an analysis of the project let's say the economic viability of the project we need to take into consideration that things may actually actually change in the future like for instance when we talk about environmental issues you can translate that to what will be the consequences if a strong heavy uh, carbon tax is levied on, on, on fuel what will happen to the demand then and we cannot say for sure of course but we can work out some scenarios best case worst case and, s and the case in between and try to say see whether the project's viability economic viability is uh, sensitive to whether we get a positive negative or in between development some projects are are very strong uh, they can survive almost anything when it comes to taxation and traffic development and everything whereas others are very vulnerable to let's say economic downturns things like that so we need to be aware of that things might change and in this it's also uh, a bit we, we need to think a bit about changes in preferences there has been a a strong <coughs> preference for increased mobility in the population and uh, it's uh, and that goes together with what I uh, just said about forecasting it it is a question whether that will be a sustainable uh, this focus on increased mobility will whether that will be sustainable in the future Planning <coughs> is the other term here, de deals with the preparation and implementation of actions designed to address specific problems like urban congestion or connectivity to remote areas, to the regions from the central, let's say the central eastern Norway to, to the periphery like Molde. And there are examples from other countries represented in the audience as well I think you some of you presented Brazilian remote uh, or air transport system to, to the remote regions which are pro projects like which addresses this this problem <coughs> um, so why do we need a trans transport policy and uh, this is because transport systems are sort of the 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 veins the network that connects economic agents it connects uh, people and companies the regional national and international level global level um, and um, as, as economists we uh, can say that if 
we have the traditional, let's say, competitive equilibrium conditions fulfilled, which is in short that the market is able to work this out by, the, by itself because uh, you have a free flow of information, you have free entry and exit, and, uh, and everybody are, are sort of price takers. So we have everything actually, uh, all this communication is, is done through the marketplace. But this sector is not characterized by this, uh, it cannot be said to, let's say, uh, represent such a situation where the market is taking care of everything. Because we have external effects, <coughs> like, and an external effect is where, let's say, the carbon taxes that is, uh, as is imposed on uh, on uh, on fuel, is not uh, dimensioned based on the the social costs of uh, of uh, carbon emissions. They may be set too low. That is a normal situation. And quite a lot of international transportation is, is characterized by, by that. So that is one, one external effect that, that needs to be taken into consideration when we try to assess uh, projects and plan big infrastructure projects. You have imperfect markets, <coughs> and the transport sector is characterized by uh, increasing returns to scale that you have large initial uh, investments and uh, smaller variable operating costs. So you have a, a diminishing average cost curve, meaning that the larger the volume, up to a certain extent, the capacity limit, the average costs of using the transport network will, will go down. And when you have such scale effects, you are uh, not in a situation where you can uh, can set prices equal to uh, to the most efficient at the most efficient level, which is the marginal costs, because then the operator, the transport provider, will will go bankrupt. So we need to set prices higher than the uh, than the marginal costs, and that is an uh, that is a market imperfection. You have monopoly situations. You may have natural monopolies, like uh, this local airport, because it's, uh, it's natural in the sense that it is not a good idea to have two airports here in this, uh, in this relatively small or sparsely populated region. One airport is, uh, is sufficient, and hence <coughs> By nature, it's then it then acts as a as a monopoly, and then you have to to connect transport planning with other types of uh, other sectors also, like, for instance, um, let's say town planning, where residents should be located. Uh, should you connect residential areas with the central business district, district by means of road, subways, and so on. So there are lots of, let's say, uh, needs for coordination with other policy areas. Of course, <coughs> it's a means to achieve political, political goals or objectives, but uh, at the same time, uh, one could think of a situation where a maximization of efficient transport systems in the short run could entail less favorable conditions in the longer run. And that's why, that's where such considerations, effects that are not taken care of by the market is so important to include in the planning process. 
I can give you one example. American cities, and we'll look more into this later on, but American cities are, with a few exceptions, characterized by a very small urban core or center and, uh, and the, the population and the, the housing and the companies and everything that is connected to the city is spread out over a very large geographical area. And to be able to support that, uh, highways have been built, an excellent road system or highway system in, in many American cities. But there is a problem connected to energy use when we consider such urban systems heavily based on private cars to, to be able to move around. And can you give me a keyword for what type of effect or external effect has not been taken into consideration when many American cities have been planned. And then I'm now we are back to the, let's say, the early 20th century. The environment? The fuel taxes, which has to do with the environment. Because uh, <coughs> fuel has been uh, considered almost as a human rights issue in the, in, the, in the United States you have you have a, you have an you are you have the right to drive your car to the lowest possible costs that has been the the mantra so to speak for for decades and uh, and roads and uh, and the transport network should support that you can ride your own car so to speak not your horse but your car it's a slight difference, but uh, I think the ideology is about the same thing. Individual freedom and, 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 and all that, which is, which, is, which is kind of good. But when it costs too little to, to, to move around, you get too high demand for, for, uh, for motorized transport. And you get cities spread out with excellent uh, road networks. But but you are sort of dependent upon that system, and it creates a kind of a path dependency. Which is <coughs> something that we we should be very, very aware of that when we talk about planning and transport planning. Because what we do, or what we have done in the past, can strongly affect what we are able to do in the future. Because if you have constructed a, a, uh, an efficient road network, which causes people to live in a, in a let's say, uh, where you get what we call urban sprawl, people live scattered around. It's very difficult to, let's say, implement a good public transport system because uh, because of the because the city, the, the urban area is less less condensed and very spread out. Uh, whereas let's say to do it the other way around just as an example to start with a dense structure with a heavy focus on on public transport does not to the same extent cause path dependency because then you have the you have the opportunity to grow at a later stage in time let's say 40 years from now or 30 years from now um, but it is much harder to reverse a process where, where urban areas are scattered and widespread at, at the outset. 
So modern urban planning is very focused on uh, on uh, on this on uh, and on let's say minimizing the energy use and uh, the use of fossil fuels. This is a, a very very hot topic these days, and uh, it attracts a lot of concern. New York, at least the central parts of New York, is an exception when it comes to, to American cities. It's a very dense uh, city center at Manhattan. And also the, <coughs> the satellites around New York, like, for instance, Brooklyn, is also quite, quite condensed. So uh, it, uh, it serves well, let's say, the need of, of uh, minimizing energy use. So New York City will not suffer a lot if carbon taxes is going to be trebled in the future. Whereas the uh, city of uh, Dallas, Texas, which has an urban core where people can walk around, which I think is about the same size as Molde, the city center, about the same size as Molde. But the whole city is, uh, I mean, it's millions of people living there. But the core is very small. They will suffer <coughs> if the carbon taxes are, are trebled. Because then uh, the mobility, the urban mobility will be, be reduced. So transport planning is a process. <coughs> and uh, we try to think in terms of uh, a bottom-up process, that is the ideal way of thinking. Uh, try to, to work <coughs> as a planner with the communities, try to find out what are the, the visions and their needs and their perspectives for the, for the future. And, and then uh, try to work out how transportation, the transportation network fits into this picture. Uh, so try to, to work with, uh, with the local authorities and, and try to find out how, how these transport, uh, transport improvements can, can support their, their view of the future. And then <coughs> this, is, this is actually very important, to understand the types of decisions needed to achieve this vision. And this puts quite a lot of demands on the planners and on the, uh, on the uh, professional analysts that is working with this. Because you can, you can try to come up with a result from an analysis, like uh, if you do a cost-benefit analysis, you come up with a net present value. If you remember back to lecture number two or three, where you put the net present value on the table and say that the net present value is positive, meaning that the benefits outweighs the costs and the project is profitable. You put that number on the table and say to the decision makers that this is something you need to go forward with. You should build this project because it's good in terms of efficiency. And they will look at you <coughs> and they will think, Oh geez, what an idiot. And I will do something completely different. That is, that is a normal case, because they don't understand then what is embedded in this net present value. What happens to employment? What happens to the users? What happens to, to the distribution of wealth in society? Where are the, where are the tra traffic flows going? Which groups are affected? and so on. So that is why we need to understand what, what type of evidence is needed for the, for the decision makers to, uh, to uh, sort of make the necessary decisions. And I have to say that uh, people like myself, 
has worked quite a lot with uh, with economic impact assessment. It took took a while to understand that these, say, net present value numbers, and the economic figures, were not too easy to sell to the decision makers. They needed more information. And uh, you should also be aware of that if you, even if you provide them provide the decision makers with let's say all the relevant information you can think of they may have have their own political agenda and they may decide against let's say so the good projects decide something else but then at least we can say that they have made an an informed choice based on relevant information so uh this is this is very important and uh, and then to uh, to do as i saw, uh, told uh, as i said on the previous slide to to uh, to assess let's say what is listed there is actually the uncertainties connected to the future development. And that could be, for instance, uncertainties connected to fuel taxes, uncertainties connected to different growth patterns, whether let's say Molde will continue to grow as a city. They plan a dual carriageway from the airport and into the city center. Fjellsvei in Norwegian. And uh, that is of course based on a, an, an assumption that the city will grow, but in the, b in the big picture maybe that uh, you, have you get a strong centralization towards other parts of the country, like the, like the Oslo area, which could affect uh, the viability of, of such, uh, such plants. We don't know that for sure. Identify the consequences of alternative choices. And that is important because uh, alternative choices may have different impacts on creating path dependencies. I can give you another term which has to do with this and that is real options. And real option thinking is to keep options for future development open as, far as, as long as you can, if those options can contribute positively to, let's say, the objectives which may be about economic efficiency uh, or other aspects of, of development. <coughs> we did a study on, it was, a, it, it was one of the earliest when it, come to it came to that, that uh, type of, uh, of approach. And that was the city of Bergen uh, on the western coast of, coast of Norway. They were in a situation where they were going to choose, ch choose by, uh, between an improved highway network or an improved public transport network. And then we, we, we uh, addressed that problem and we worked out a report which said that if you choose the highway development strategy, you will close parts of the, let's say, the possibilities to develop a, an urban transport 
transit system at an earlier stage, uh, at a later stage. But if you choose to develop the public transport system and then wait and see if you then need an extensive uh, road highway network, you keep some options open. Then you can see at later stage if the transport demand develops, you can invest in, in, in roads at a later stage. But it's very hard to do it the other way around. Because uh, road networks have implications on land use and the city becomes more dispersed. As I, as I said uh, earlier. So it has to do with this. And then to, uh, to, uh, to uh, carefully address alternative ways of solving the needs for improved transport up against different system performance measures. Could be like uh, if you set targets for uh, for traffic development, you can measure uh, whether the projects are serving those needs. If you have s uh, policies on, on land use in urban areas, whether you should have a condensed or a widespread uh, urban system, you can, uh, you can address the various options in designing the transport network up against such objectives. And in the end, a transport plan should end up with an investment program. So there are <coughs> nine basic elements to consider when we talk about transport planning. And they are, um, they are quite, uh, quite important to bear in mind. Uh, <coughs> economic factors affecting development. That has to do with uh, impacts that can uh, impact from, from the or consequences of, of uh, transport improvement that can affect development. We have talked a bit about that in connection with, uh, let's say, competition, increased volume of imports to the region and so on. Population, composition of the population or demogra and demography and growth, that has to do with forecasts. That is input in our forecast model for, let's say, many years ahead. So, so uh, element number two has, has, has direct consequences for our forecasting model. The interplay between land use and transport system, transport systems, has to do with how the traffic distributes between routes, between transport modes. And it has, <coughs> let's say, also relevance with when we study causes and effects. If we establish a, a, a let's say, a, a, a subway line, a railway, light rail, and we compare the establishment of a railway, a light railway, with a public transit system based on buses, vehicles. So we compare a light rail subway with a bus service. What could be <coughs> the difference when I talk about, uh, if we talk about the transport system as a premise for land use, what could be a difference between s 
such the two system layouts that I mentioned and the impact on land use. One, a bus transit system based on existing roads or even uh, new roads, or a public transit system based on a railway. Consider yourself as a property developer. You're going to build uh, houses for people or you're going to build uh, buildings for, uh, for manufacturing or whatever. And then you can choose between two types of public transport systems. Say you are considering whether you should expand your activities in a, in a region with uh, rail, light rail, or in another region which has focused more on, uh, on bus, bus transit. <laughs> Property developers, they are strongly in favor of, uh, of the railway solution. The reason is that it reduces risk. It is because when you, when you invest in a railway, it's so expensive that when you take that decision, it's highly likely that, uh, that the service will continue it will not be. Uh, it will not be. Uh, let's say turbulence or variations. So it will be there for ages. At least if they construct a new one. That that is. That is normally how the develop property developers perceive this. Whereas a bus transit service can be adjusted. It can be closed down on a very short notice. So if you are going to develop, let's say, a new or build a new part of a city to expand to, to let's say, serve a growing population, to, to support, uh, let's say, establishment of, uh, of different industries, a rail, light rail system is much more attractive. So that is what what is included in this point, um, the interplay. And I mentioned just one. I mentioned another one a bit uh, earlier, namely the, the urban, the, sorry, the American cities and, uh, and the layout that they have chosen on the transport system. Where a road-based system causes a stronger focus on, uh, let's say, city spreading, urban sprawl, than more dense urban structures, perhaps based on, uh, on, on public transport. Transport facilities, <coughs> that has to do with, uh, let's say, th that one, and point six has to do with uh, uh, market considerations. Of course, the facilities here is l related to this one, but it, uh, it is also related to, let's say, market preferences. We have uh, an issue in Norway now with, uh, with the main cargo terminal in Oslo, which handles a lot of cargo inbound to Norway and then split for uh, further distribution to, to the regions and to the, to, the, to the capital and where that terminal is going to be located and how it should be expanded. And then we, uh, we can run some uh, studies on that and try to work out what will be the optimal location of such a terminal. And uh, the studies, they conclude that the existing location, a bit northeast of Oslo, is the optimal one. 
so it should be expanded there. And the uh, plans are currently put on hold, uh, but uh, so we don't know exactly what will happen. But we need to address market needs uh, when, we, when we plan such big, big infrastructure projects. Travel patterns it says something about the current situation, but we also need to know, uh, try to work out what will happen in the future. And we can model that to a certain extent by using information about travel behavior for different groups in the populations. We know quite a lot about, uh, by uh, big surveys, we know quite a lot about, for instance, a lady in the mid-30s with, with two kids living in an urban area or a, or a semi-urban area. How is her travel pattern? How does it look like during a day? How many times does she have to go to the urban center? Does she, would, uh, would she prefer to use a car or a bus or whatever? Based on where, her, where she lives and how the transport system looks like around where, where she lives. We have a lot of data for such groups and we can by using those data in uh, mathematical models, we can model how the travel pattern actually looks like. And we can also model how a new piece of infrastructure can affect the travel behavior. Come a bit back to that later on. Traffic control features <coughs> is important when we, uh, when we deal with this because uh, let's say, how we implement congestion pricing in urban areas will have a strong impact on uh, the traffic volumes and also transport mode choices, perhaps also route choices. And in the, let's say, finally, it will have an impact on also this the land use pattern, and so on. Yeah, I think I will elaborate a bit more on this, uh, so I will uh, I will stop now, and we we break before we continue. <coughs>